My name is Laura Regal. I am from Trenton, Ohio. I currently reside out in Preble County and I have been in recovery for four and a half years now. Um, when I was growing up as a child, I had, I mean, the ideal childhood, I guess you would say. Um, my parents worked um, full-time jobs. I was a good student. I played sports. I was involved in any extracurricular activity that I could get involved in. Um, when I was two years old, my mom was married to my biological father and she took me and my brother and went into hiding. She went to the YWCA because he was very abusive. He was an alcoholic. Um, it was just a, it was a really bad situation. So my mom removed me and my brother from that situation. And when I was four, my mom had been dating this guy and they got married. So in 1994, and later that year, he adopted me. Um, my biological father signed over his rights, so um, I then had a new father. Awesome man, um, but he was a functioning alcoholic. He would go to work, um, come home, drink until he went to bed, and then he'd wake up and do it all over again. That was like his routine. But it didn't, there was no legal issues with it. Um, he was never abusive. Him and my parents never, or him and my mom never fought. So it wasn't really an issue. He was what you would call a functioning alcoholic if there's such a thing. Um, so I was, I was in a good home. Um, that, everything was great up until I was 15 years old. Um, when I was 15, I was raped by somebody that I went to school with. Um, I didn't tell my parents about it. I kind of shut down. I didn't really want to deal with it. I told a couple of my friends, um, one of my friends in which made me tell my parents a week later. So um, after I told my mom, my mom took me to the Trenton Police Department and we were going to press charges but there was no evidence. I had waited too long to tell anybody about it and it was basically my word against his. They said that I'd have to take it to trial, I would have to testify, I would have to explain to a jury everything that had happened and I did not feel comfortable with doing that. I did not want to deal with it. Um, it was not something that I really wanted to talk about, let alone go into detail about. So I kind of just let it go and shoved it down and just didn't deal with it. Um, so nothing was ever brought about that. Um, that was when my issues started with addiction. I didn't realize it then, but I realize it now. I started drinking um, on the weekends. I was in high school, so I didn't think that it was a problem. I mean, high schoolers, they drink on the weekends, right? Like, that's normal. That's what I thought. So that's what I did. I would party on the weekends, and then come Monday morning, I'd go to class. I had good grades still. I was on honor roll. I was on the varsity soccer team. Um, I did everything that I could. I, I lived this perfect facade, but deep down inside, I was, clearly I was broken. I was self-medicating issues that I just didn't want to deal with. Um, I started cutting after that happened. I would cut myself in the bathroom. I'd cut my arms. I'd cut my legs. Um, it was just a way that I, like to me, I felt grounded. It was um, a way that I knew I was still kind of here. Um, that was something that went on for a little while until I found opiates. Um, when I was in high school, I was hanging out with people that my parents told me I shouldn't be hanging out with, but at this point, I'm a senior in high school and I'm 18 and I have the I'm 18, you can't tell me what to do attitude. And I knew everything. Um, I knew that these these were my friends, you know, we were having fun and and like they cared about me and they loved me and they accepted me and I mean that's 
that was our thing. We we partied on the weekends, so we would we would drink, and then it got to where I started smoking weed my senior year in high school after soccer was over. Um, I knew that I couldn't smoke while I was playing soccer because they did random drug tests, and I couldn't let my parents find out that I was smoking weed because that's just not acceptable. Um, so I waited until after soccer, and my addiction started taking off full force. Um, I started smoking on the weekends when I was drinking, and then that kind of led through the week, a couple times a week, to the point where it led I was smoking weed every single day. Um, I got to where I would start drinking before I went to school. I showed up to school a couple times drunk, um, but I never got in trouble for it, so I thought that I wasn't doing anything wrong, really. There was no repercussions to my actions, so I just continued to do it. Um, but these people that I was hanging out with, they were doing pain pills on the weekends, too. And they were doing pain pills through the week, and that was something that I was never going to do. I wasn't ever going to try it, and... That just wasn't my thing. I was just having fun. I was just drinking, you know, smoking some weed here and there. Eventually, I was at a party, and I was heavily intoxicated, and I got offered a line. Everybody else was doing it. The guy I was dating at the time, he was doing it. My best friends were doing it, and I, I kind of felt like the outcast by that point. And I'm like, well, okay, well, what is it? Okay, it's, it's Oxycontin. Um, so I did it. First time I'd ever did a pill. I was drunk anyways. Um, and I remember I got so sick. I was puking. I had the sweats. I, I mean, it was just a terrible, terrible situation. My night went south really fast. Um, I woke up the next morning and I was still puking. Um, I remember my friend was taking me home and we had to pull over like every couple miles because I just kept puking out the car. And I remember like it was yesterday, I looked at my friend and I said, I am never doing that again. I'm so sick. This is not fun. Like this was supposed to be a fun weekend. Like we're having fun and this is not fun. Um, but I went to a couple more parties. That was like our thing. Um. And eventually I got offered it again. And they're like, oh, well, you were only sick because it was your first time you'd ever done it. I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to get sick like that? No, you won't get sick. Just We just won't give you so much. I'm like, okay, well, we can try it. Um, I wasn't drinking as much. And when I did it, I got an entirely different feeling. Um, it was almost like a numbing feeling. Um, I, I couldn't really feel anything. Um, it just, it kind of felt great. Uh, I wasn't dealing with feelings. Um, I didn't really have anything that I had to worry about. And I was okay. I wasn't puking. I was like, okay, well, this isn't so bad. So I continued to do that. I would do some pain pills here and there on the weekends. And then by this time, I've graduated high school. And I didn't go to college. I went to a vocational school for three months afterwards and got a nail technology degree. I worked at a nail salon. So I was 18. I had all this extra money. I have no bills. I still live at home with my parents. And I really don't have anything else to do. So my partying continued. Um, it went from the weekends to a few nights a week again. Um, I found myself drinking, I don't know, four or five times a week at night. And then I'd wake up, I'd go to work, I would get off and I'd do it all over again. And this became an everyday thing. On top of this, I have accumulated a pain pill problem. Um, I have a habit and I'm doing them every day. I would drink at night, but during the day I would be doing pain pills. And I would be doing benzos and really anything that I could get my hands on. I had friends that would just give me stuff, so it's it's free, right? I'm I'm not having to pay for it, so why wouldn't I do it? You know, I I mean I'm 
an addict. I didn't realize it at that point yet, but I was. Um, so I got to the point where I was doing pain pills every single day and the people that I was getting these pain pills off of, they got in trouble. They quit getting prescribed all of these pain pills and I remember waking up this was the first time in probably a year and a half that I hadn't done a pain pill and I woke up and I felt so sick my stomach was in knots I was sweating I was sneezing um, I got to the point where I was puking and that was when I realized what being dope sick was um, I was very uneducated as a child. I was very sheltered in my life. So I was really never taught about drugs, really. Um, I mean, we had the D.A.R.E. program in like third grade where they're like, just say no. But I mean, if it was that easy, everybody would just say no, right? So that was about the extent of my education on addiction. So I found out for myself what being dope sick was. At this time, I'm dating somebody that is 10 years older than me. And I am the only one working. He wasn't working. And I started buying these pills off the streets. I wasn't getting them from my friends anymore. And then that was when I realized how expensive it was. I was trying to support two people's pain pill habit. And I was spending probably two to $300 a day on pain pills. And that went on for a few months to the point where that was literally all I was spending my money on. I didn't even have money to buy alcohol anymore because I was buying all of these pain pills just to get me through the day. Um, so I put my foot down and I said, I'm, I'm not buying these anymore, I can't afford it. And the guy that I was dating was like, well, I know somebody that's got heroin. And I'm like, heroin? I'm not going to do heroin. What do I look like doing heroin? Like, that's not me. And he was like, well, it's like a tenth of the price and it gives you the same effect. I'm like, really? Well, I guess I'll try it, right? What can it hurt? I'm, I already have a pain pill habit and I definitely can't afford it and I'm not going to be dope sick. So that was when I was introduced to heroin. Um, I did it and... I wasn't dope sick anymore. I realized that I was saving my money. I, it was like it, it finally fit in my budget. Um, and I could support both of our habit and it wasn't affecting me financially anymore. Um, so that went on for about six months. Um, and then I started shooting it. I got to the point where... I was having to snort way too much and it was becoming just as expensive as the pain pills were. So that was when I was introduced to the needle. Um, this guy was like, well, you know, your tolerance is just built up and I mean, there's other ways you can do it. You can shoot it if you want. And I'm like, no, I, I can't do that. And he's like, well, I'll do it for you. I'm like, all right, but I'm not going to watch because I'm terrified of needles. So he did it. And it was like the first time I ever did a pain pill, I got that feeling all over again. And it was like, it was, I was numb again. I didn't have a care in the world. Um, it's like almost like an out-of-body experience. And I wasn't sick anymore. And again, it was a lot cheaper than it was before. Um, so that was when I seriously started to spiral out of control. Um, my parents got wind that I was on drugs by this time. We're in 2010. Um, the nail salon that I worked at, it was in a small town. They got wind that I was on drugs and I lost my job. So now I've lost my means to support my habit. Uh, I don't have money coming in. So I was dope sick one morning and I knew that I, I had to get a fix. 
Um, and it was like I didn't have a conscience. I didn't have any values anymore. I didn't have any morals anymore. And I was going to do whatever it took to just go get some and feel better. And then I would just deal with it after the fact. Um, so that was when I started stealing money out of my parents' wallet. Um, I, I mean, I did this every day. I didn't have a job. Eventually they caught wind of it and they started locking their bedroom um, with a deadbolt. But I quickly learned how to pick locks and I could still get into it. Um, I, I would pick lock, I would pick the lock on their bedroom when they were gone and there wasn't money there. So that was when I started stealing jewelry. Um, I started stealing jewelry or I would hawk the TV or the brand new laptop that I just got or some tools out of the garage. I mean, it, it didn't really matter. Um, if it was bolted down, it still wasn't safe. I mean, I would, I was at any means necessary to get a fix. So this went on for a little while and that was um, when my parents finally sat me down and my mom told me that she was kicking me out and it was like my whole world just crumbled. This like little safety net that I had had, no matter what, I knew I had a place to lay my head at night and my parents were still there for me. My parents put their foot down and they told me that I'm moving out, um, that my mom's packing my bag and I'm either moving out and I'm going someplace else or I'm going to rehab. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't have anywhere else to go. So I guess I'm going to go to rehab. But I thought that I was still controlling everything. And I told my parents that I would only go to rehab if I could pick where I went. And they're like, deal, fine, you're getting help, that's fine, where do you want to go? Florida. Let's go to Florida. It's like a vacation, right? Um, I had no intention whatsoever on stopping my use. Um, it was just like a break. It was literally a vacation. Um, I went there, I continued to stay in contact with the guy that I was still dating by this time, and... Um, I scheduled my flight for the day that I knew he was getting his prescription from the doctor. So I scheduled my flight for 28 days later and I flew back into Dayton, Ohio from West Palm Beach. And within two hours of getting off of the plane from rehab, I was in a bedroom getting high again. Um, I didn't work any kind of program while I was there. I didn't work on any issues while I was there. I literally was there because it was a break. It was a break from this chaos of a life that I had been living for a few years. And I kind of like regrouped my sanity, I guess you would say. Came back home and started it all over again. Um... So it didn't take long. I did pain pills when I first got off the plane, but it didn't take long to where my tolerance was built back up, maybe two weeks, and I got back on heroin. I got back to where I was shooting heroin, but when I came home, I thought that I would be okay if I just didn't do heroin because that was like when my life just spiraled out of control was when I started doing that. So I'll be okay if I do something else. Well, I found out real fast that that was my distorted thinking. And within a, within a month, I was right back to where I was um, in full-blown addiction. Um, I had just set it on the back burner for a little bit. I didn't really deal with it. So about two months after I came home from rehab, um, I caught my first legal charge. Um, the guy that I was dating, we got high in my car, and he overdosed in my car. Mind you, this is the first time I've ever been in a situation like this. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was going on. Um, at first, I thought he was playing. And then I'm like, okay, well, he, he's going to wake up. He's, he's just really high, right? 
he was in the driver's seat of my car and we're in the middle of a cornfield getting high because it was in the country so he's overdosed in my driver's seat and he's twice as big as I am and I don't have a cell phone because I'm an addict and I've got rid of it by this time and I know that I've got to call 911 I've got to get help somehow because at this point his lips are purple and he's not breathing and he's like completely drenched in sweat so I jumped out of the passenger seat of my car. I literally jumped on his lap and drove my car to civilization. I drove straight to his house and I parked it and I jumped out. I ran inside. I told his grandparents, they got to call 911. I don't know what's wrong with him. And they're like, well, is he on drugs? I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know what's wrong with him. I just need you to call 911. Well, the cops got there and I didn't realize that with paramedics come the cops and everyone else so when the cops got there I was charged with permitting drug abuse because he was in my vehicle when he overdosed um, he ended up surviving but I ended up going to jail and I remember having to make that phone call to my mom and telling her that I was in jail um, that I just got charged. I minimized the entire situation to my parents just so I could get out. I told my parents that I saved someone's life and they locked me up for it. And my parents being the enablers that they are bonded me out that night and my addiction was still there. Um, I ended up going to court and I ended up getting put on um, misdemeanor probation. I had to do a year of that, but I'm a full-blown drug addict and I definitely cannot pass a drug test at this point. And I think my probation lasted maybe a month. Um, at this time, I still don't have a job. I am stealing from anybody that I can. Um, I ended up stealing my grandparents' checkbook and started writing checks. I started cashing checks, and they were coming out of my grandfather's account. And I did that for about a week before anybody got wind of it, and I just kept writing them. I was like, wow, I can't believe that they're still cashing these, you know. Um, and I remember I walked into the bank, and I went to cash this check, and they were like, well, hold on a second. I'm like, okay. So they go back to the back. I'm like, okay, well, they're just getting money or something. No, they'd called my grandparents and my grandpa told the bank to cash the check, um, but not to cash any more after then. So the bank, oddly enough, still cashed the check and I took the money and went straight up to Dayton. Um, by this time, he's called my mom and told my mom what's going on. And I know I'm in a world of crap when I get back, but all I was worried about was getting high at this point. So while I'm on my way up to Dayton, my mom is blowing my phone up. Um, I just didn't answer it. She kept leaving me voicemails and I was getting text messages and all of this, so... I waited until after I got high because I needed, like, to be in my right frame of mind. And I called her, and she was like, I can't believe you would do that. I can't believe that you're getting high again, and I'm calling your probation officer. And it was like my whole world stopped turning. I'm like, my probation officer? Why would you call my probation officer? Because I'm telling him what you're doing. I'm like, well, great. So here, here it goes, right? So my mom called my probation officer and they violated me. They put me in jail for six months, told me that they would get me into treatment because clearly I'm a drug addict. And I, that was in um, 2010. I went to jail for a decent period of time. I had never done more than a few hours in jail. So it was very new to me. Um, but my parents, being the enablers that they still are, 
made it comfortable for me. They made sure that I had money on the phone so I could call them whenever I wanted. And they made sure that there was money on my books so I could eat whatever the jail offered as opposed to the trays because I'm a spoiled brat and I'm not eating that. Um, I told my parents that I couldn't eat the food, that I was just going to starve myself. Just kept manipulating them to get money. Um, I was getting so much money on my books that somebody told me in jail that, like, when you get out, if you have money on your books, they just cut you a check for whatever is in your account. Okay. Well, mind you, I, I'm clean at this point, but I haven't worked on anything still. I'm just sitting in jail. I have no choice but to not use. That's because I have no means to get it at this point. So I sit there for five and a half months, and my probation officer called up to the jail and wanted to talk to me. And he talked to me, and he told me that he found me a bed that I could go into treatment and he could get me out in the morning. I think I had like 11 or 12 days left on a six month sentence and I was done with probation. I didn't have to deal with them anymore and I basically told him, no, I'm not doing it. You let me sit here for five and a half months when you knew I needed treatment. I get out in 11 days as opposed to this 90 day program that you're trying to send me to? Absolutely not. I'm not doing it. So I hung up. And I laid it down for 11 more days and I got out. Within this period of time, I am cutting back on the commissary that I'm ordering so I can have money when I get out because I still don't have a job and I'm definitely still an addict. So I get out and I had almost $1,000 saved up on my books. So Butler County Jail writes me a check. I went and picked it up the next day within 24 hours. I didn't want it mailed to my house because I didn't want my parents to find it because I didn't want them to take it. You know, that, that was my money. Um, and that's, that was what I was going to use to get high again. So I go and I get this check. I wasn't out of jail 24 hours after doing six months and I was getting high again. Started out with pain pills again and then that quickly moved to heroin by this time, I'm um, smoking crack, I'm um, shooting heroin, I'm drinking, um, popping Xanax. I mean, anything that I could get my hands on, I did. I was out for two months, and I was driving around with my friend, and we were just robbing these stores because we had got wind that there was this place in Middletown that would give you a dollar per shampoo bottle that you brought them. I'm like, a dollar? Well, you hit up five or six stores and get a hundred bottles. That's a hundred bucks. So it was like a quick little lick for us. So we did that. We just kept doing that. Um, uh, I remember, I mean, we probably did it for a month maybe before we got caught, um, we went to the dollar store in Middletown, and I went in and was buying stuff. I was like the decoy. My friend would go in, and she would stuff her giant purse-looking duffel bag thing full of all these shampoo bottles, as many as you could get. Um, if you can get 20 per store, you know, that's $20. We've got enough to feed our habit for the day, you know, if you hit a, if you hit a few. So we go into the store and, um, we load up on these bottles and we take them back to the car and we probably hit like three or four more doing this and we make our way back to Trenton and we go into Family Dollar and I'm still being this decoy, um, while my friend's loading up her purse, she goes out to my car, she empties it, she comes back in, she does it again. By this time, we've been smoking crack all day, shooting dope all day, um, probably been up for a few days, so neither one of us were in our right state of mind, and she emptied the purse, came back in, emptied the purse again, and sat out in the car. 
She came back in, got my keys. I'm walking around. I'm still buying some stuff. And little do we know that the clerks have been watching us. Um, they know exactly what's going on. We didn't know what was going on, but they knew. Um, we didn't know that somebody was watching. So I get up to the counter to pay for my stuff. And the lady said, what do you have in your purse? I was like, I don't have anything in my purse. Because I'm not the one that's stealing, right? I'm the decoy. Um, and she was like, well, are you sure you don't have anything? I'm like, yeah. I set my purse on the counter. I'm like, you can go through it if you want. She's like, no, that's okay. I'm going to call Trenton Police Department, and we're going to get them down here, and they can sort out the details. All I heard was police, and I immediately thought jail, and I was not going back. Um, I remember I snatched my purse up off the counter, took off running to the car. My friend's sitting in the car in the passenger seat smoking a cigarette, and I'm yelling to her, start the car, start the car, you know. And I jump in the driver's seat. I literally didn't even have my door shut. The car's already started. I put my foot on the brake. I put it in drive, and I floored it. Store clerk by this time standing in front of my vehicle, and I hit her. She tumbled up over the car, hit the ground. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even look back. I sped to my parents' house as fast as I could. I just knew that I had to get out of there. I had to get off the main drag in Trenton, put the car in the garage, and I just sat there. And my friend's like, you're an idiot. Like, we're going down. That's, that's robbery. You just left the scene of a theft. On top of that, you just hit this person in the parking lot. And so I start freaking out. I call my mom and I tell my mom exactly what happened. And she tells me to get out of Trenton. So I did. I got out of Trenton and I went and stayed at my friend's house. My mom came by after work and she gave me some money, told me to lay low for a few days. Maybe they wouldn't know it was me, you know. Um, they come to find out the cameras weren't rolling at the dollar store that we had, that this whole incident had happened at. So they didn't have me on camera, but they had a description of me. They had a description of my car. They had a description of my friend. Mind you, we had been at several different stores this day doing the exact same thing. So they run an ad in the newspaper and someone called that had seen me that day and said, well, I know exactly who that is. And they told him it was me. So by this time, we have Trenton Police Department calling my parents' house. I'm blowing their phone up. And my dad calls me and tells me that they know it was me and they just want to talk. I'm like, Dad, it's, it's not just about talking. Like, I'm not, if I walk into that police station, I'm not coming out. Like, they're going to put me in jail. He's like, no, no, no. They, they just want to talk to you. They just want to get your story. All right, well, Trim Police Department's harassing my parents at this point. And I love my parents to death. Um, I didn't want them to have to keep going through this. So I got really, really high. And I called my dad to come pick me up. My dad picked me up, drove me to the police station. They sit me down in an interrogation room. And they start asking me all these questions. And I told them exactly what I did. I told them that I hit the clerk in the, in, in the parking lot. I told them that I'd been stealing stuff all day and... I, I was sorry. That's not what was supposed to happen. They immediately put me in handcuffs and charged me with a felony one aggravated robbery and a felony two felonious assault. Um, it was like my entire world crashed. That's serious. Um, those are some serious charges. So they take me to Middletown Jail and I sit there. I go up the next day for, for my arraignment. Um, it's like a probable cause hearing to see if there's enough evidence to bound it over to the grand jury. And there was, um, they had witnesses that had seen me. They had my own <laughs> confession. I told them what I did. Um, so my parents being the enablers that they still clearly are, um, they bonded me out. They didn't want me to sit in jail. I told my parents that I needed to get a lawyer. This was, this was really serious. Um, that I was probably going to go to prison if I didn't get this figured out. So they bonded me out. Um, I think it was two days and I was getting high again. 
Um, by this time, I've got all of my own issues to deal with on top of the stress of probably going to prison for a very long time. And I, I just wanted to be numb. I didn't want to have to deal with it anymore. So I started getting high. I was out of jail a month and a half, and I nodded out at the wheel and totaled my car. I went off the road. Thank God I didn't hit anybody. Went off the road, and I broke my back. Well, that was an outlet for pain pills. You know, I just got hurt in this accident, and I'm a heroin addict anyways, so now I can do pain pills and heroin. I'm about to be real high. Um, so, yeah, that, that was what I did. It was four weeks later. For some reason, my mom let me still drive her car, and I went up to Dayton. And I came back, and on my way back, I hit myself while I was driving. I shot up while I was driving, and I fell out at the wheel, driving down Route 4. I went left of, left of center, and I hit a pickup truck head-on. Um, the only thing that I remember is the airbag hitting me in the face that woke me up, and then I couldn't breathe because of the, the dust from the airbag. Um, I woke up the engine to the car was like sitting right beside my leg um and the only thing i could think about was where's my dope it was just it was sitting right here i i mean i gotta find this i wasn't worried about being hurt i wasn't worried about the other person being hurt i was just focused on getting the drugs that i had just went and purchased you know by this time i'm sitting in somebody's front yard and they come running out of the house like, we just called 911. Are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm scrambling, trying to get, trying to find my stuff, you know. That was the only thing I was worried about. They're like, you need to sit down. You need to get out of the car. Here's a chair. Um, I wasn't worried about that. They sat me down. I immediately got back up and started, rum like, rummaging through the car. Um, I found my stuff. I put it in my sock, and I sat back down. They transported me to Miami Valley Hospital charged me with an OVI, and I just remembered the nurses were so nasty to me, and I just couldn't understand why. Only by the grace of God, the person that I hit didn't get hurt, um, but I had broke my back worse than what it was the previous month. So we're two months out, and we're in 2011 at this point, and I have a broken back. I have no vehicle. Um, I am, I mean, what you would think would be my rock bottom. I mean, I feel like I'm pretty close, right? So, I'm on pre-trial at this point, and I can't pass a drug test. Um, we're in June of 2011, and my brother lives out of town, and it was my niece's birthday party. I think it was her first birthday, and we got invited to it, obviously. It's our family. And I found that as like an outlet to run and get clean, right? Um, I knew it was about to be terrible. I just didn't know how bad it was going to be. Um, so I went up to Columbus and I stayed with my brother. I was there for two and a half days and I couldn't take it anymore. I told my sister-in-law to take me to the Greyhound station that I was going back. Um, by this time it's Monday morning and my pretrial officer called me. Um, I had already failed a couple of drug tests, but they hadn't locked me up. So I really didn't feel like there was any repercussions to the things that I was doing. Um, I had no VI, but I figured my parents would take care of that for me because they took care of everything else. Right. So, I mean, I, I just really wasn't worried or concerned about anything. So my pre-trial officer calls me. I'm on the, the Greyhound bus. She says, you need to come in here before the end of the day. I'm like, all right, I can do that. I'm on my way back. So I go in there, and they immediately lock me up. Um, they put me in jail, and I was in jail for two months. My parents spent, I don't know, probably about $12,000 on a lawyer because I'm sitting in there on a felony one aggravated robbery and a felony two felonious assault plus fleeing the scene of an accident and an, OV an open OVI case. Um, so I'm just in a world of crap right now. So my parents get me this lawyer, and I don't know how he did it, but they got me out two months later on felony probation. 
Um, they dropped my charges down to a felony for vehicular assault. I admitted that I hit the lady with my car, um, but I didn't, at that point in time, I didn't feel the bit, a bit of remorse for it. I mean, I, I didn't really have a conscience still. So I get out in August of 2011. By this time, my brother is getting married in about three weeks at the end of August, and I was supposed to be in the wedding, but I can't get my life together for a second um, to even go get a fitting for a dress, so I'm taken out of the wedding, and that was when, like, my resentment started. I told them that, well, since I can't be in the wedding, I'm not going, um, so I didn't. I didn't go to the wedding. I missed my brother's wedding. Um, not only was I mad, but I started using within three days of getting out on felony probation. And I knew I couldn't go away. I just tried to go out of town and go cold turkey and try to detox myself and try to get my life together. Um, and I knew I couldn't do that again because I clearly I failed the last time. So I wasn't going to do it again. So I went and stayed with some guy and that I was dating at the time. And I get a call while they're out of town. And my dad has fell out at the wedding reception. I'm like, fell out? What do you mean he fell out? Um, he had ongoing issues that he never went to the doctor for, for um, cirrhosis because he's a functioning alcoholic still. Um, he was like this for his whole life, but I mean, he just did it here. He did it every night, so it didn't affect his work. It didn't affect anything really except for his health, but he wasn't the doctor going kind of person, so he just never went. So my dad ends up coding at my brother's wedding reception and I'm freaking out. I'm not there. I'm four hours away back home and they're up in uh, past Columbus and that was when the start of my dad's issues began. Um, he ended up signing himself out of the hospital and he came back home, never went to the doctor, continued to drink. Um, by this time we're in 2012 the beginning of 2012, my dad had been throwing up blood for three days before he told anybody. And he told my mom. And um, my he's like, I think I need to go to the hospital. So she's like, okay, well, let's go. So they're on their way to the hospital. And my dad pukes and looks like something out of the exorcist. Like it's complete straight blood. Um, so my mom's freaking out. I'm off high somewhere, not caring about anything, really. Um, so they get to the hospital. They had to give my dad a blood transfusion stemming from addiction, from his alcohol use. Um, the cirrhosis that he's going so long without treating is burning up his esophagus from the acid and the blood vessels rupture and it's just like he's slowly bleeding to death. So he goes to the hospital and they immediately took him back for a blood transfusion. Um, so I went and I, I seen my dad in the hospital. By this time, my parents have kicked me out. Um, I'm not living with them, but I still have means to get into the house. Um, if I didn't, I would have found a way. Uh, I, I mean, I was a drug addict, and I was going to do whatever it took and hurt whoever I had to hurt and betray anybody that I could to get what I wanted. I was a very selfish person. So while my dad's in the hospital, I go and I see him, and I leave, and I go straight to my parents' house, and I steal my dad's truck. Um... I don't have a car because I've totaled it. My mom's not letting me drive hers because I've been yanked off their insurance. So I steal my dad's truck and I drove it around for a little bit, um, picking up things to scrap uh, for some quick cash, you know, to get a quick fix. So I did that off and on every day while he was in the hospital. I would just go back and park it and then if I needed another ride, well, I'd just have someone drop me off at my parents' house. I'd take the truck. I'd park it back like nothing ever happened. 
Meanwhile, I'm stealing my dad's tools out of the garage. I'm stealing whatever electronics out of the house that I can get some money for. I'm going to the pawn shop like it's my day job. Um, the scrap yard like there's no tomorrow. Um, I, I just, I did whatever I had to do. I stole whatever I had to and I would just deal with the consequences later because, I mean, it seemed to be working okay for me so far. And... So we're in 2012, and my dad's, they tell my dad that he's got six months to a year to live if he quits drinking, and I'm a full-blown drug addict, so my parents let me come back home because my dad's in, like, real bad health, and he's not in a good spot, and they thought that I would do some good if I was at the house trying to help, and, I mean, I wasn't. I was not in a good spot myself. I was still in full-blown addiction, and I get to where I don't have anything left that I can hawk. I don't have a means to leave because I can't steal the truck anymore. I can't get anybody to come and pick me up, let alone if they come and pick me up. I have no way that I can get drugs. So in 2012, I, I'm standing in the bathroom of my parents' house, and I just I didn't want to do it anymore. Um... I didn't want to be there anymore. I was in full-blown detox. I had been trying to sleep, and maybe I could just sleep it off, but when you're in detox, you can't sleep, so that wasn't happening. Um, so I go to the medicine cabinet in the bathroom, and there's two bottles of Tylenol PM. Score. I'm like, okay, I can take a few of these, and I'll be fine. Um, I figure I have a tolerance. I'm a full-blown drug addict, so I'm going to have to take more than what a normal person would have to take, right? So I dump out a, a handful of them. I eat them, and then I get to thinking, and I'm like, you know, I just really don't, I don't want to be here anymore. Like, I was in a really dark spot. I couldn't see past five minutes from now. Um, I felt like my whole life was just going to continue to play out this way so I ate 84 Tylenol PMs and I jumped in the shower um was in the shower for 20-25 minutes I don't know I get out of the shower and I'm starting to feel like kind of lightheaded and I'm like okay well maybe maybe I'll just go smoke a cigarette you know I'll go lay down and I'll just go to sleep um so I make it out to the garage and my mom's looking at me and i there must have been a look on my face, uh, something missing in my eyes. I don't know, but my mom knew something wasn't right. She's like grilling me, asking me what I took, what did I do, you know. I said, I just took some Tylenol, you know. I took some PMs. So we go to the bathroom, and she comes to the realization that I didn't just take a couple of Tylenol PMs. I had taken two bottles of Tylenol PMs. So she rushes me to the hospital get to the hospital, they have to hold me down because by this point I'm so irritated, you can't touch me, don't come near me. I was like, I mean, I remember bits and pieces of it, um, the parts that I was in and out, and I was just like real volatile, I was cussing the nurses out. They'd get an IV in me, I'd rip the IV out, like I, it was like I couldn't control anything that was going on in my body, so they end up sedating me um, and getting this Tylenol flushed out of me, I mean, pump in my stomach, I guess. I don't remember. I lost two days. Um, I woke up, and the doctor sits down next to me, and he tells me that I had enough Tylenol in my system to kill three people. But somehow I'm still sitting there, and they're discharging me, and I'm going to the psych ward. A psych ward? I'm not crazy. I just ate some medicine, you know, like, that was like my rationalization that I just, I couldn't grasp, like, the seriousness of the situation that had just played out. Um, had my mom not taken me to the hospital and had I just went and laid down, I would have died. Uh, no doubt about it. They, they told us that. Um, so I go to the psych ward. I'm placed on a 72-hour hold. And within 72 hours, I'm released. And I go back home. Um, mind you, I've got like five days, so like I'm kind of pretty much detoxed at this point. I mean, but that didn't stop me. I continued my ripping and running. I continued my drug use. I 
was introduced to meth at this point as well. So I'm smoking crack, I'm smoking meth, I'm doing heroin, I'm drinking, I'm popping benzos. I mean, you name it, I did it. Um, occasionally eating some X here and there because I didn't have to pay for it. So, I mean, my addiction just spiraled out of control. I thought it would be a good idea. And this is where the distorted thinking comes in. So I thought it would be a good idea for me to go back to school because I needed to do something with my life, right? We're in the fall of 2012. So I'm like, okay, well, I want to go back to college and I'm probably going to get like a student loan check, right? So that's going to be like a couple grand and I don't have a job. So um, or I'm like in between odd jobs like serving or, you know, something that's not going to take me anywhere. So I'm like, okay, so I'll sign up for school. And I signed up for school and I went, I was going to go for drug counseling. Here I am, a full blown heroin addict, and I've just enrolled into college for drug counseling. Um, I don't know what in my head thought it was a good idea, but I had to pick something in order to get a check, so that's what I did. Um, so I. I go back to school. Um, my parents are still claiming me on their taxes. So this student loan check that I thought I was going to get, I was considered a dependent of my parents still, and I didn't get a dollar. Um, in fact, we had to pay like 800 bucks out of pocket in order for me to just go to college. So I went, I kind of skated through for a few weeks, and I never went back. Um, I realized after... I hit a certain age, I could go back, and I wasn't considered a dependent of my parent. I would get a student loan check. I would get some money, and we would just revisit this at a later date. Um, my drug use continued um, up until 2014, and I'm still on felony probation at this point. Somehow, um, every time I go in to drop and take a drug test, I'm like buying these drinks from the gas station and flushing or drinking vinegar or drinking pickle juice. I, I mean, I did a nice and like the nice and flush and like my skin was on fire. Like somebody had to have known what the heck I was doing. I walked in there and looked like I had just came off of the equator. My skin was so red. Um, but, I mean, it continued to work for me, so I continued to do that. So, in 2014, I totaled another car on the way back from Dayton. I spun out on the highway. How somebody didn't hit me is beyond me. But I spun out on the highway, totaled my car. Thank God nobody was injured, so now I don't have a car anymore. Um, and I enrolled back into school. I started, like, three days after my car accident. And still going to be a drug counselor. Um, and by this time, I'm not considered a dependent of my parents. And I get this student loan check, you know, and everything's all hunky-dory. By this time, I have learned that if I start selling heroin, I can get high for free, right? If I sell enough of it, I'm going to be able to get high for free and I'm a waitress, so it's cash in my pocket anyways and that can be my spending money. As long as I can like hit this quota every day of selling heroin, then I can just get high for free and it's not affecting my life. So I was doing that for a little bit um, and I flunked back out of college um, in March of... 2014 I was pulled over on my way back from Dayton and I had well over seven grams of heroin on me and the cops pulled me out of the car searched me found the drugs they charged me with possession and trafficking um, somebody had told on me that I was selling drugs to get out of their own trouble um, that's part of the game, I guess. That, I mean, I, I got arrested in front of my parents' house, and I just knew the disappointment that my parents were going to have because they thought that I was clean. Um, they had been paying for me to go to the methadone clinic for a little bit, and my mom would drive me to make sure that I went and make sure that's what my money was going towards that she was paying for. 
But I mean, as soon as I'd leave the methadone clinic, I'd be right back at a dope boy's house or trap house getting high, and then I'd wake up and do it all over again. As long as I got that methadone in the morning, the rest was history, right? So my mom thought that I was doing good, but I wasn't. Clearly, I wasn't. Um, so I get arrested for trafficking and possession, and I'm still on felony probation. And in Butler County, I had since I was arrested in Trenton and I had to go to Middletown jail, I had 14 days before the probation department was going to get wind that I had caught new charges. So to me, I had 14 days to get myself out of jail. Otherwise they more than likely were going to send me to prison. Um, and I wasn't ready to deal with that. I wasn't ready to stop using drugs. So, um, so I detoxed on a jail floor for 10 days. Um, it was terrible. I mean, I was puking. I couldn't eat. I didn't hardly sleep at all the entire 10 days that I was there. And I was constantly on the phone trying to tell my mom to get my money and bring it up there and get me out. Um, I even explained to her the whole 14 day thing. So she let me sit there for 10 days because she thought she was letting me dry out. She came up, bonded me out of jail. I got out on the 10th day. So I still had four days before probation was going to get wind of it. So I had four days of freedom. Um, I was out 18 hours and I'm um, sitting in my parents' bathroom shooting dope again. Um, only this time it, it was a little more serious. Um, after being released, after 18 hours of being released from Butler County Jail, I overdosed. This was the first time I'd ever overdosed. I had seen plenty of people do it, but... To me, I knew my limits. I was like a smart drug addict. That wasn't going to be me. I I knew my limits. I knew what I could handle. Um, and, and I wasn't going to be that person, right? Well, I found myself that person. I woke up in the bathroom and my parents are standing there like, holding each other and um my mom's like bawling her eyes out and the trenton police department is grilling my parents like you should have left her in jail you never should have got her out you're gonna kill her you know like basically telling my parents how awful of people they are because here i am fresh out of jail ain't even been out a whole 24 hours and they're having to come and respond to an overdose in their bathroom so they stand me up and they like kind of help me walk over to a chair in the living room and they start going through my pockets and I've got dope on me again I've got needles in my pocket on top of my mom handing them needles as soon as they walk through the door so they I'm not stable they have to um, keep an eye on me because I just overdosed so they take me to um, Middletown to Atrium Hospital, take me to the emergency room, and I'm cuffed to the bed with a Trenton police officer. Um, I remember I couldn't hold my eyes open to save my life. Um, they unhandcuffed me because they needed to get a urine on me, and they take me to the bathroom, and I was so out of it that I couldn't even sit on the toilet without falling over. Um, and I remember them telling me that if I didn't pull it together, they were going to hit me with Narcan again. And I'm like, I, I can't, no, no, you're not hitting me with Narcan again. That sends you into detox, no. So I, I pull it together for like a good two minutes. I give them a urine and I'm right back out. Um, this went on for God only knows how long. I woke up the next morning. It was three o'clock in the morning and I was by myself in a room, um, while I was in the ER, my brother had came to see me with his wife and one of my nieces. And my brother's like giving me the third degree, doesn't understand what's wrong with me. Why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep putting my parents through this? And him and the cops start arguing because he's telling my brother that he can't be there. And he's trying to explain to him like, that's my sister. She almost died. I'm not going nowhere. So they end up getting into a feud and... My brother tells him that technically he doesn't have jurisdiction in Middletown. So he le he doesn't really have rights in there because at this point we're in Warren County now. And we're in Middletown, Franklin, whatever the atrium hospital is. And 
So they unhandcuffed me from the bed. I do remember this. They unhandcuffed me from the bed and the officer hands me a business card. And he says, you got to turn yourself in when you get released from the hospital. I'm like, okay, I'll get right on that. You know, I'll turn myself in as soon as I'm released. Um, they had charged me again with possession and trafficking. I had coke on me too, so I got charged with two possessions. Possession of heroin, possession of coke, and trafficking heroin. Plus like 30-something needle charges. They charged me with each individual one that my mom had handed them and that they found in my pocket. So I'm sitting in the hospital. I wake up. It's like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm by myself. And I call my mom. She doesn't want nothing to do with me. Can't get anybody to come there. Um, my mom shows up the next morning when they release me. She takes me home, and I immediately go to my bedroom, and I start packing bags. My mom's like, what are you doing? I'm running. Um, I now have five new felonies on top of being on felony probation, and to me, that was a prison sentence. Um, I couldn't see past any of that. Um, yeah, I'm a drug addict. Yeah, I need help. But right now, I got to worry about not going back to jail. And that was all I was concerned with. So I packed my bags and I kissed my mom. I kissed my dad. I told him I was gone. I was leaving. I rented somebody's truck and I drove around. Um, I continued to get high for a day and my probation officer calls me. By this time, it's 14 days after the first time I'd been arrested being on probation. And he's talking to me and he's like, look... You're going to die if you don't get in here. You know, you need help. You're a drug addict. We can take care of this, but you got to come up here. And by this time, he'd already talked to my mom. Him and my mom were on good terms. Um, so I call my mom. I talk to my mom, and they talk me into going back home. My mom's like, you know, we got to get through this. We'll get through this. You know, we're not going to turn our back on you. We're there for you. I'm like, all right. So they take me up to the probation department on March 19th, 2014. And I turned myself in. I sit in my probation officer's office and I look him dead in the eye and I tell him that if he does not get me into treatment and get me away from this environment, that I'm going to die. That my parents are going to have to bury me. Um, it was it was a surreal situation. Like, that is exactly what was going to happen. Um, I had escaped death on many occasions. Um, it was beyond me why I was still there. I thought I was being punished by God or something because, I mean, why wouldn't he just take me just in my misery, you know? Like, I didn't understand why I had to keep going through this, but, I mean, I was still there for a reason. So, I knew what the outcome was going to be if I continued to live this life. So, my probation officer puts me in jail. Within a month, he gets treatment facilities to come and assess me. But I sat there for months. I sat there from March until August, until my sentencing date. Um, by this time, I'm still not getting treatment. I'm just institutionalized at this point, and I am mad. I'm sitting there like, I came to your office. I told you guys that I wanted help. I was, like, begging you to get me in somewhere, and you're just going to let me sit here? You're just going to, like, lock me up, and you're just going to make me sit in jail for months on months like I could have done went to a program and I could have already been out at this point and been on with my life but here I am still sitting in Butler County Jail in J-Pod um so I was getting sentenced in the middle of August and my sentencing was on a Tuesday I had already made up my mind that I was turning down the program that I was accepted into I was accepted into the Monday program with the condition that I started felony probation all over again. And I was not okay with that. I, yeah, I was clean, but I still was not in my right frame of mind. I still hadn't dealt with any issues. And I was just a very bitter person at this point. Um, they had let me sit for so long. And I'm around all these different people that they're not positive people. I mean, I'm in an institution. I'm in jail. Um, these aren't. It's not people that you need to be around if you're trying to make some serious decisions in your life. So I had decided I was turning this program down and I was just going to go to prison 
because if I went to prison and I got my time over with, I'd be off probation anyways. So I wouldn't have to deal with this anymore and I could just move on with my life and everything was going to be hunky-dory. Well, that's my distorted thinking again. Um, I found out that I had 52 months to do. I was a drug addict and I could probably get out on good behavior, do like two, two and a half years maybe with time served. Um, and I, I was completely okay with that at this point. Um, I thought it would be better than going to a facility where they dictate what you can do and like give you all these guidelines and make you like dig deep into yourself and make you work on your issues and like prison sounded a lot better it sounded like more freedom at that point um so here we are middle of august 2014 and my sentencing is on a tuesday and my mom comes to see me on sunday morning and that was one of the worst visits of my entire life. I mean, none of them are good, right? You're in, a, you're in jail. But I could tell something was wrong with my mom. Um, I didn't know what it was, but I knew something was wrong. She just wasn't right. Her eyes were all swollen. She looked completely exhausted. And she proceeded to tell me that my grandfather had passed away the night before. And it was a terrible feeling. Um, I was confined watching my mom bawl her eyes out over a computer screen in the jail. That this is how she had to break the news to me. I'm in this confined space. I can't go anywhere. I can't, I mean, I can make some phone calls, but I don't really have anybody that I can talk to. Um, I needed to be there for my mom. Um, this, it was her dad. It was, I mean, I was, it's a lot to deal with on top of having to deal with your kid being in jail. Um, I freaked out. I hung up the visit phone. I didn't even finish my visit. I went to my cell. I started screaming. I started punching things. I literally lost it. I lost my mind. And, um, I, I, there was nothing I could do. There was absolutely nothing I could do. I was stuck in this facility um, worst that could happen, they put me in isolation by myself, um, but I'm in jail, this kind of bad behavior, it's kind of expected, right, um, that's the environment that you're in, so, um, that was on Sunday, so my mom got a hold of my lawyer and gave him, like, the funeral proceedings and stuff like that, and they were gonna try to get me out on a furlough, um, uh, mind you, my track record for running was, I mean, it was pretty inevitable. Like, that's probably what I was going to do. Um, I had already planned on that. If they gave me a furlough, I was going to the funeral and I was running. Um, and I went in on Tuesday for my sentencing. And the judge looked at me and he said, you are not getting a furlough. You're a danger to yourself. You're a danger to society. And this is one less thing that your family needs to deal with in this time that they're going through. And I was, like, crushed. Like, I it was like, what? Here I had my hopes up on getting out and going to this funeral and that I was going to run afterwards so I was going to be free, right? Um, but he told me. Um, because at this point my lawyer had told him I was turning down the program and I was going in for sentencing on that Tuesday. So, um, he already knew I was turning down the program, so he gave me an ultimatum. He said that the sheriff's department would escort me to the funeral and I could go to the funeral, but I had to take the treatment program. If I didn't take the treatment program, I was going back to jail, I was missing the funeral, and I would be riding out to prison in the next week or two. Well, at this point, I wanted to go to the funeral. You know, it was my grandpa. It's, it's family, you know. I wanted to at least be able to pay my respects and say my last goodbyes. So I was like, well, whatever. Whatever I have to do to go to this funeral, that's what I'll do. I'll take it. So he's like, all right, postpone my sentencing for another week because I accepted this program. He takes me to the funeral, and I mean, it was so humiliating. I was escorted by the sheriff's department. 
I was in my orange jumpsuit. I had shackles on my feet. I had a belly band. I had to go two hours before the actual funeral, so I was there by myself. Um, it was like, I wouldn't say a humbling situation, but it made me really think about where my life was at. Um, and I was dealing with it by myself. Um, and I think that was the hardest part was like, it's still my grandpa. And as much as I need to be there for my family, I need my family to be there for me too. Right. But that was, that was something that wasn't possible at the time. So I sat there and I did reflecting. The last words that my grandfather ever told me was that I needed to get my crap together or I was going to be the death of my parents. And it was like those words, I still hear them like it was yesterday. And um, he was right. Um, I hadn't been great to my grandfather. I told him I was sorry. I told him I loved him. He told me he forgave me. He told me he, he loved me too. But at the end of the day, when he took his last breaths, I was still not living right. And I didn't want that to happen with anybody else in my family. Um, so that was when my life took like a huge turning point, I think. Um, looking back on it, it, it was like what really got me thinking. Um, so I go back to the jail. And a week later, I get sentenced to this program. So I'm waiting to go to the Monday program for six months. And I ended up going in October of 2014. They take me to this um, facility in handcuffs. It's a lockdown facility. It's a correctional facility. So I go there and I figured I had to be there anyways. I might as well take what I can from the program. Um, clearly, whatever I'm doing is not working. So maybe I can take advice from people that do this for a living. Um, so that's what I did. I got into this program. I hunkered down in it. Um, I started working on like my rape situation and how I had suffered from PTSD because of it. And then I had ADHD that went years without being treated that I was able to start working on and come to find out I've got like, a me I've got mental illnesses that went undiagnosed and like all of this other stuff so it's like I go in there and I didn't just work on one thing like I went in there and I worked on everything I put everything out on the table to my counselor and I knew that I had to do something different because I was not going to keep living like this um so I was there for just under six months um while I was there I kept in contact with my parents. My parents came to see me every weekend. And um, they had told me, because my grandfather's house was empty at this point, that my mom had told me that if I got my act together, that I could have this house. That I could relocate and I could go to this house. But I had to prove to my family that it was going to be a smart investment for them. That it was going to be the right choice to make. Because as of right now, I'm sitting in a treatment facility. And I don't have my life together. So I'm like, okay. So then I get to thinking of things that I need to do when I get out. Um, I Clearly, I have to do aftercare. Um, I have to do an outpatient program. So I do that. I get out. I immediately get a job. Um, I got a job. I hit meetings, NA meetings. I started meeting sober people. I had friends that were sober and in recovery. And then I had friends that I had grew up with that didn't have addiction problems and stuff like that. So I started reconnecting with those people. And the people that I used to hang out with, I cut all ties with. Um, that was one of my big things. Every time I would go to jail or I would get in trouble or whatever it was, I always went back to the same environment. I always went back to the same place. I hung out with the same people. I continued to do the same things. And I knew that I had to do something different. So that was what I did. And I ended up doing good at it, I guess. Um, my mom let me move out to the house, so I was relocated. I wasn't in this, I wasn't in Trenton anymore, which is where I grew up at, and um, 
it was like a breath of fresh air for me. Um, I, it's out in the country, so I didn't have to deal with anybody. So it's not like people just come up to your house and knock on your door looking for you. I changed my phone number so nobody could get a hold of me. Um, I cleaned up my social media and all of that, so that wasn't an issue. I didn't have to worry about people getting a hold of me that I didn't want to get a hold of me. And that was what I continued to do. Um, when I got out, I found out um, a little after I was released from uh, treatment that I was pregnant um, with a guy that I was seeing. And I currently have my two year, two and a half year old daughter, and I named her Serenity, um, meaning like peace of mind. So it's like she's like that constant reminder um, that there's no turning back for me. Um, since I have been out of treatment and in recovery, I have hit the ground running. I currently work in a in an inpatient treatment facility and I'm a recovery coach so I mentor people on a daily basis. Um, to me that was really important because when I was in treatment I had a counselor and I know it sounds cliche but she probably saved my life. Um, she had a, a history too. And it was like all of these other counselors that I had seen, I felt like they couldn't relate to me. Like they didn't know what I was going through. Um, and it was like this lady, it was just different with her. It was like I could talk to her and she knew exactly what I was going through. And like I could open up with all these things that I had never talked to anybody about. And she sat there like, I get it. I've been there. I know what you're going through. So... For me, that was like a huge turning point too because for once in my life, I felt like somebody understood. Like somebody got it. Somebody knew what I was going through. And I wasn't just like some outcast, you know. I wasn't alone in all of this. So for me, my job, it's super important for me because I'm able to mentor people and I'm able to be that person that can relate to them. I'm able to let these people know like you're not alone, you know. I things happen, people make mistakes, but people also go beyond this and they come out of this and they get it together and they do recover. Um, since I've been out, I do outreach work. I have spoke on many different occasions. I have spoke at public events. I have done newspaper articles. I've done news articles. I've spoke with the news before and um, just about anything that I can do that relates to recovery to get it out there to raise awareness whether it's a walk or a video or just sitting down and talking to somebody you know just anything I can do to try to give back because for so long all I did was take I took from everyone around me I took from people I knew, people I didn't know, people I cared about, people I didn't care about. I, it didn't matter. I just took. That was what I was good at. I was good at taking from people. So, like, it's it's really nice to be able to finally give back, you know. And it's, like, fulfilling for me. Um, so, that's that's what I enjoy doing now. I, enjoying, I enjoy helping other people. And um, I will have four and a half years in recovery on September 19th. And I just found out, since I've been out, I've been paying off my student loans from bombing college. Um, I've paid them over $7,000 now, and I have a $60 balance that will be paid off next week. And I'm starting school in October for social work. I'm finally going back, but I'm going back for the right reasons. I'm not going back for that check. I'm going back for that degree because I'm going to be able to help people that were in a situation like I was.